the modern urban culture that we live in and in particular that we work in is built on a structure of hierarchy and authority. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. We need org charts and management structures. But somewhere along the line, somewhere probably close to the fall of mankind, these structures became abused. And instead of them being simply mechanisms for things to function well, like companies and schools and hospitals, instead of being used just to help them function well, they became temptations for individuals to seek authority for the sake of gathering power. And with that power to garner for themselves fame perhaps gather a sense of self-importance, perhaps even accumulate wealth, and ultimately to have a sense of control. All of which comes at a great cost to somebody, and most often to the masses of society. Would you agree with me that the pursuit of power is a core contributing factor to a lot of the problems that we have in our country. Leads to things like corruption and all forms of abuse. And not just now, but historically in our country. So we need a handle on how to deal with power and in particular the pursuit of power. And as Christians, we have to fortify ourselves from this influence and importantly, flourish as a community in spite of this temptation for power. Now, as Christians, we have a radically different alternative way of thinking about power which if truly implemented in our lives and in our Christian communities, really could transform the worlds around us. And it's a way of living that comes directly from the life and the teaching of Jesus Christ himself. So let's have a look this morning at that passage that was read just before the sermon. We're going to walk through it really slowly, line by line. Mark chapter 10, reading from verses 35 to 45, which is Jesus talking about the corrupting influence of power and how we as Christians are supposed to live. So Mark 10, reading from verse 35 all the way up to verse 45. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to Jesus, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Now let's just pause there for a second and go, what kind of a question is that? They are basically asking Jesus for a blank check. Whatever we ask of you, we want you to do for us. Now, how is Jesus going to respond to that? Surely something along the lines of, well, it depends what you're going to ask, right? I'm not a genie in a bottle. Let's listen to how Jesus responds. And he said to them, verse 36, What do you want me to do for you? Which is a stunning answer. It's not what you would expect at all. We would kind of expect some sort of reprimand for asking such, such a blatant question, asking for anything that they want. But Jesus doesn't reprimand them. He asks, well, what is it that you want? Which is repeated just a few verses later. If you go on to the next story, in verse 51, as Jesus is healing a blind man named Bartimaeus, he repeats those exact same words. What? do you want me to do for you? So this is a question that Jesus asks with great intent. What do you want me to do for you? It's a question he asks us today. And so then they 
answer him in verse 37. And so they said to him, Grant for us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left hand in glory. So I kind of get the impression that James and John are feeling a little bold here. Maybe they expected some sort of reprimand. They didn't get the reprimand. Jesus says, tell me what it is you want. And so they go for it, man. They go literally for glory. They ask for positions of prominence and power in Jesus's kingdom. That's what they're asking for. So in Jewish culture, at a, at a gathering, let's say it's a meal or a feast or celebration of some sort, the guest of honor would sit in the middle with their best person at their right hand, literally their right hand man, and the second best person at their left. And so James and John are asking for those seats, positions of prominence and authority and power in Jesus' kingdom. Now, at least let's give them something here. At least they got one thing right. They recognized who had the main seat, right? They knew that Jesus would reign and maybe they're just putting their investments in the right place. So surely now Jesus is going to let them have it, right? Blatantly asking for these positions of prominence and power. Let's see what Jesus says. Verse 38, Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? Which again is amazing. Jesus doesn't let them have it. He's not reprimanding them here. He teaches them about what they're really asking for. See, in their minds, James and John, these positions of being kind of in Jesus' inner circle, of being in close proximity to Jesus means in their minds, in their culture, that means prominence and power. But Jesus says, no, 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 to be close to me, to be in my inner circle, to be in a place that is central in the kingdom, to be my disciple, what that means is you've got to drink the cup and be baptized with my baptism. And you go, well, hang on. Well, that's not too bad, is it? We're about to do communion right now. You've got your communion elements. That's not so hard. And baptism, well, if I haven't been baptized, I'll go to the next class. This is not all too bad, is it? No, no, no. Listen, dr to drink the cup is a powerful Old Testament metaphor. As it was a symbol of suffering. So when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's about to be betrayed and crucified, he prays that prayer. Remember Mark 14, 36 says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. It's a symbol of judgment. It's a symbol of suffering. Are you able to drink the cup, Jesus says to James and John? And are you able to be baptized in my baptism? And he's not here particularly talking about water baptism. The word literally means to be immersed or to be overwhelmed. And again, figuratively used often to talk about being overwhelmed with suffering. For example, Luke 12 verse 50, Jesus says, I have a baptism to be baptized with and how great is my distress until it's accomplished. That was after he had been literally baptized before he would go to the cross. This is what it truly means to be in the inner circle, to sit at Jesus' right and his left, to be in a place of centrality in the kingdom. In other words, to be a disciple means to drink the cup and be baptized with the baptism. So what Jesus is asking James and John is... You don't know what you're asking. What you're really asking for means to be willing to suffer. Are you able to suffer like I am going to suffer? That's what he's asking them. And they answer in the beginning of verse 39, and they go, Yes, we are able. 
I read that and I go, man, these guys are naive. There's like no way they know what's about to happen here. I mean, even this question, this, this occasion comes up after Jesus had predicted his suffering. The disciples are not good at getting this, how Jesus is going to suffer. So I'm thinking there's just no way. They're, they're naive. But the reality is James and John would drink the cup and they would be baptized with this baptism of suffering. James and John would be the first and last of the disciples to be martyred for their belief in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus actually affirms this in the end of verse 39. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. He knows they will. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left hand is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. So Jesus affirms, yes, they, they are going to do this. And then he adds this little teaching moment here on the subject of rewards. Rewards. Because that's perhaps what's deep in their hearts. They're not only looking for, when they ask that question about right and left, they're not only thinking prominence and power. Perhaps they're also looking for recognition. And so Jesus addresses this. And basically what Jesus says is the whole matter of rewards is left to the hidden purposes of God, he says. See, because disciples are not meant to follow Jesus because they know in advance what reward they're going to get. The point of following Jesus is not the reward. Following Jesus is the reward. And there should be no sense within disciples' willingness to suffer just because of what they might get out of it. There is something about rewards in the kingdom, but we're not meant to know. It's not meant to be a motivation for being willing to drink the cup and be baptized with the baptism. Basically, Jesus is saying to them, don't focus on rewards. Just know that God notices and God rewards. Summary of what Jesus is telling them. Don't you be concerned with that. God sees. God rewards. Which is another huge cultural temptation for us. See, Jesus is not just saying to James and John that you're not meant to be positioning yourself for prominence and power. He's also saying to James and John, you're not meant to be positioning yourself for rewards and recognition. Don't do that. Don't position yourself for that, he's telling them. And he'll emphasize this elsewhere in his teachings. For example, Luke 14, verse 7 to 11, Jesus tells this super important parable for our times. He says, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, don't go sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Hey, give your place to this person and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. So instead, when you're invited, go sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So when it comes to the subject of promotion and recognition and reward, don't position yourself for that. Don't position yourself for that. God knows God rewards. Let God be your PR agent. Do not be your own PR agent. It doesn't work. And it's just, it's just embarrassing, really, is the point of Jesus' story. 
So he has this little teaching moment with them. And then it zooms back to the occasion. Verse 41. And then when the other ten disciples heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. No kidding. Verse 42. And Jesus called them to him and said to them. Now listen here. These next few verses is Jesus now gathering all of the disciples and now he's really going to address and teach them and the essence, the summary of what Jesus is going to say is about to take place now. And so let's not miss this part. And at the heart of what Jesus wants to say to them is the, is the little verse in 40, verse 43, not so with you. In other words, he's going to make a contrast here in this teaching. So this whole moment, this whole occasion comes down to he gathers them, he wants to teach them, he's going to make a contrast with the way of the world and the way of the kingdom of Jesus. And he's talking about power. So he's acknowledging that the culture of the world is like this when it comes to power, but we're going to do things like this. And that has not changed since Jesus' day and now. So let's read verse 42. And Jesus called to them and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, in other words, the people in the world, those considered the leaders, they lord it over everybody, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. So he's talking about the rulers of the world, those who exercise authority. How does the world exercise authority? How do worldly leaders lead? Well, he describes it to them. He says they lord it over, which is, is really a phrase that describes bullying. It's a, it's a bullying term, lord it over. That exact phrase is used, I don't know if you know the story, but Acts 19 verse 16 is this story of Paul going around casting out demon spirits and these Jewish itinerant ministers come along and go, hey, that seems cool, we want to do that too. And so they try it, they try exercise demons using the name of Jesus and the demons inside this person go, hey, we know Paul, we know Jesus, but who are you? And then the scriptures say that, that, that this man overpowers them and just totally beats them. It's the same word, lords it over. It's a bullying term, the way the world exercises authority or leadership is through submission, subjugation, control, domination. That's how Jesus says the world exercises authority. It's a hierarchy based on dominance, which is very much like the world today. Still, a hierarchy based on dominance, based on bullying, based on submission and subjugation. Jesus says, that's how the world does it, and then let's not miss this. But it shall not be so among you. It shall not be so among you. Notice Jesus does not say, hey guys, that's how the world does it. Let us not, let us try not be like this. Or to use kind of a more biblical term, make every effort, guys, let's make every effort to not be like that. Jesus says, this attitude has no place among you in the kingdom of God. So let's just pause and just make sure that we get this. Just capturing James and John and their question filtering down to this teaching moment. In the world, people scramble and clamber and step on each other for places of honor and prominence. And they self-promote 
on social media and everywhere trying to rush to the best seat at the table. They measure their status by how many people they are in authority over and they abuse their authority instead of using it to serve for the good of the people and the good of the organization. Instead, they abuse it to increase their power or wealth or fame or to protect their control. But not so among you, disciples. We do things differently, Jesus says. We serve. We serve. Verse, in a verse 43 to verse 44. But whoever among you would be great. He wants to be great. He wants to be. He wants these positions of in my kingdom. What that means is you must be a servant. And whoever would be first among you, disciples, must be slave of all. That's how we do it, Jesus says. Around here, in my kingdom, we serve, we consider ourselves, get this, slaves. This is a radical departure between Christianity and the world. Perhaps the most radical departure. I heard somebody say this once that I couldn't recall where I got this quote, but they said, at no place do the ethics of the kingdom of God clash more vigorously with the ethics of the world than in the matters of power and service. I think that's true. No place do we get a greater clash. There's a greater distinction between the way of the world and the way of the kingdom of of Jesus than in the matter of power and service. Service, serving, this becomes our very identity as Christians. I mean that literally, our identity. The Apostle Paul called himself by a few names. He referred to himself as an apostle, as a teacher, etc. But he most persistently referred to himself as a servant at least six times that I can count, slave, at least four times, even a household servant. That's how he referred to himself, as a servant or a slave. Not only Paul, but James. James 1 verse 1, as he identifies himself, says, James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter, the apostle Peter, introduces himself, 2 Peter 1 verse 1. Hey, Simon Peter, a slave an apostle of Jesus Christ. John would introduce himself, Revelation 1 verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ to his slave, John. These guys, Paul, Peter, James, John, this is, this is a list of the most influential men in the kingdom, and they all refer to themselves as slaves, as servants of Jesus and therefore servants in the world. This is what it means to be a Christian. It's to be a servant. And that's not an overstatement because the last verse speaks of the identity even of Jesus Christ himself, which says, for even the Son of Man, Jesus says, I don't expect you to just do this, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. This is what it means to be a Christian. It's very different to the way of the world. So how do we do this? How do we as disciples fortify ourselves against this massive tidal wave of pressure? And how do we flourish as a countercultural community? That's exactly why it's a rule of life. It's got to be. 
how do we practice this? So here we go. Three things that we're going to build our rule of life, our rhythm on to help us do this. Number one, remember the gospel. It's quite simple, but incredibly powerful. Remember the gospel. We fight most temptations with the gospel. We especially fight pride and a pursuit of power with the gospel. And essentially, it means we remember this, guys. Without Jesus, we are nothing. And we have nothing. And we can do nothing. That's what I mean. Without Jesus, we're nothing. We have no hope of any of an eternal future without Jesus. That's the very last sentence. To give his life as a ransom for many. It's tied to this idea of slave. A ransom is the price paid for a slave to purchase its freedom. So he's using the same metaphor and going, I'm dying to purchase your freedom so that you can willingly be my servant. We have no hope of an eternal future without Jesus. We have no shot at righteousness apart from Jesus. Ephesians 2, great verse in the Bible, verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, it is not from works so that no one can boast. No one can boast. We didn't do it. And it goes on to say in verse 10, For we are His workmanship, having been created in Christ Jesus for good works, that God prepared beforehand that we may do them. In other words, even our good works, even the good things that we have done are things that God orchestrated, that He planted, that He enabled us to do by His grace and His particular providence in our lives. You say to me, does that mean that I can't take credit for anything good that I've done? Yes. Yes, that's exactly what it means. Even our good works come from Him. We have no shot at doing good things apart from Jesus. And everything good that comes our way, well, has not been earned, but comes as a gift of grace from Jesus. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6 to 7, Why, What do you have that you did not receive? And if then you received it, not earned it, why do you boast as if you earned it? The bottom line is this. Until we truly realize, truly realize that apart from Jesus, we are nothing, have nothing, and can do nothing, we will be entranced with the pursuit of power, authority, and recognition. The best way to deal with that is to remember, apart from Jesus, we are nothing. So that's number one. We remember the gospel. Number two, well, it's simple. Practice service. You know what's so great about Jesus' reinterpretation of greatness? So he says, if you want to be great, here's what greatness means. You know what's so great about Jesus' reinterpretation of greatness? Well, see, greatness in the kingdom of God is not equated to achieving remarkable athletic feats that require special genetic ability. They do not require any special academic ability like, like influential philosophers and thinkers. In the kingdom of God, anyone can be great because anyone can serve. Jesus says that's what greatness is. Anyone can be great because anybody can serve. Serving is not hard. I mean, to be sure, it it is uncomfortable. It's inconvenient. There's always a million things we would rather do than to serve. Which is why we have to make time to serve. It's, it's got to be a rule of life. There's got to be a habit around serving. We've got to make time to serve. We've got to be able to put others' interests above our own interests. That's not easy. I mean, this is not complicated. It's simple, but it's not easy to carry out. It involves, for example, what Philippians 2 says, 
do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, no, but in humility consider others better than yourself. So each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. So you know what it means to serve, really. We know. So serve. Your family. And that's part of why I know how inconvenient it is to serve. Simple, but not easy. You get home from that long day at work and you just want to flop out on the couch and catch up on Super Sport Blitz, you know. And instead, you want to help clean or play with the kids. Serving's never convenient. It's never easy, but serve your family, your neighborhood, the people living around you, your colleagues. God has put you there for a reason. Your colleagues, and if you're in a management type position, your employees, which doesn't just mean do nice things for them, it means literally do what would be best for them and take a real interest in them and their lives, not just what they can do for the company and for you. Serve. So remember the gospel, practice service, and then number three, elevate others. Elevate others. It's how to guard ourselves, how to fortify ourselves from the pursuit of power and recognition and authority is elevate other people. But this one takes a lot more work in our hearts to do. It, it could be something as simple as just praising others in public. I mean, personally too, that's great, but it's harder is to praise others, elevate them in public, or perhaps a step deeper, to give others credit. Maybe in your company. You give somebody credit, and if you know, like I know the tendency sometimes when someone deserves credit, but to like posture yourself in there a little bit, or to withhold giving that credit so that by comparison you do not look lame, but to give others credit. To celebrate with others. That instead of competing, scrambling for those seats to know God knows and He rewards it, to celebrate with others what God is doing in their lives. And then lastly, and this one, probably the most difficult and would apply particularly to those who have some kind of authority in their businesses and that is to promote or make way for others to rise, which, which could involve, this is so difficult, actually divesting power of, of perhaps delegating authority to allow others to rise instead of protecting your position and your control. This is so hard, but I've got to be honest with you, like this whole part of how this series came about was this one rule of life that I came across last year. I mentioned the resource to you last week, Praxis Labs, specifically written for entrepreneurs and business leaders. And when it came to this part, which they titled Power and how we have to fortify ourselves, just listen to how they described this particular rule. They say, our vocation places us in intense working envir environments that grant us power and status, tempting us to use these gifts for our own control, gratification, fame, and ego, often at the expense or exclusion of others. Our inherited patterns of historical injustice have not afforded equitable shares of power or status to women, people of color, and many others within our vocational reach. So instead of accumulating power to benefit ourselves or exploit others, this is their rule, we use the power we have to generate possibility for those who have less access to opportunity. 
And then I love how they go on to, to the, the actual principles. As a baseline, we commit as a company to the practice of gleaning, frequently sacrificing opportunities for our own advancement to intentionally create pathways for others. Man, when I read that, that just like, if that had to happen, it would be so transformative. It, it sounds impossibly hard. But for a Christian whose identity is very much a servant of the kingdom of Jesus, who knows what that means, who knows what Jesus did, well, perhaps generating possibility for those who have less access to opportunity is within our reach. And we can do this. So church, let's fortify ourselves from a power-hungry, recognition-craving, rewards-centered society. By living like Jesus, by hearing the teachings of Jesus and appropriating the death of Jesus on our behalf into our daily life, I believe it could be one of the most transformational things we do as Christians. Let's pray. Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our example, the one who opened the way for us to enter into this kingdom with all of its benefits. Jesus, we pray and plead with you today that your life with teaching, your death, and your triumph over these principalities and powers, these ways of living, would truly be integrated into our lives. And this can only happen through a work of your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, work in our hearts to subdue our desires for recognition, our craving for attention, our positioning for honor and influence our reluctance to hand over control, authority. Would you break that within us, Holy Spirit, and enable us to live sacrificially, serving those around us for your sake and for your glory, for their own freedom in our families, in our communities, in our workplaces. We pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to this sermon from Rosebank Union Church. If you've enjoyed this message, please feel free to share it with others. And if you would like to support the work of Rosebank Union Church, please visit the giving link on our website at ruc.org.za.